Good morning. Welcome to Grace Chapel and Grace Chapel Online. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Those of you who are able to, please ride with us as we, and stand with us as we worship. If you're not able to, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter whether you're standing, sitting, laying down. The important thing is we worship God this morning. Right, we're going to start with our first scripture, Ephesians 2, 19. You and I have been adopted into God's family and have become God's children. And we're going to sing family of God. Could somebody please turn the back monitor on? Scripture is going to come from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now this morning we're going to try a new song. It's been requested that we learn it. We're going to do the best we can. Just sing with us as well as you're able to. It's not going to sound exactly the way you might have heard it on the radio but we're going to give it our best. We're going to introduce it probably once a month so you get to learn it. It's called All Sufficient Marriage. <laughs> Right. 
this morning comes from 1 Peter 3, 4. But let the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the old ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of God, great price. And we're going to sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit this morning. Goodness, that thing is just pointing right.
All right. Good. Wow. That's really loud. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day and kind of a little depressed today because I guess this is the end of summer today. And no more summer. We're in the fall. But one good thing about fall is pumpkins, right? Pumpkin this, pumpkin that, pumpkin that. I love I have almost everything pumpkin, except in my coffee. But hopefully everything is doing great. Um, a couple announcements we have. We have the church fellowship on this Wednesday at 630 in the top of the yard. Come join us for volleyball, yard games, and just having fellowship together as a church body. Uh, apparently we had a race yesterday. Grace Chapel had a nice showing yesterday for a trail run to support Camp Susqua. Uh, it's Christian camp in Williamsport area, and you know, I, 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 we have a congratulations that somebody won a medal here. I think it was uh, Riley. Riley, I think you won something yesterday, didn't you? Why don't you go ahead and stand up, and we can all congratulate you for winning on there. And then what an accomplishment, running. And, and also, unfortunately, Joe's not here. He also won in the medal, too. So, you know, a little congratulations. Shake your hand and say, hey, congratulations for running a fast race. Uh, so we have that little fun thing. We have a fall fest on October 6, 4 to 7. A little brochure here, of course. Also, again, see the pastor and Riley. You know, they're doing a wonderful job. We need people to sign up. We need people to cook chili for cook chili cook-off. We need people to do things. We need volunteers. Uh, a little caveat going to that. I'm here to beg you guys. Anybody that wants to help out, please see the pastor, the deacons. We need help. We, at the beginning, sometimes at church service, are scrambling. Where should we put this guy? Where should we put that? So we need some people help, especially if you... Want to help in a sound booth? We want to help sound. You want to help computer? Anything? Ushers? We need help. Please, please, if you find it in there, come see one of us, and we can plug you in anywhere in the church. Uh, all right. So that's about that's about all the announcements I think we have. Of course, we have every Sunday morning a Bible study. You know, if you want to show up early to church, show up to that. Uh, and that's about all we have for announcements. So uh, let's go ahead and stand. And I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you that we can come in a free country, come and worship you at a church. We just pray that you'll be with us, guide us. We just pray also for the leaders that are, we have a, a thing in our country that we got to really pray about, Lord. And I just pray that you'll be with us in this decision that we got to make. I just pray that you will take that decision and do it for your will, Lord. We just need an awakening in America, and I just pray that you will do that. I pray that you'll be with this church. I pray that as we're doing a multiple of things that we you lay it upon people to, to volunteer, to help out, to strengthen this church, to strengthen your church, and we can do your will. We just pray that as the pastor comes forth today, that he gives a message, that we take something out of it that you want us to do, that you want us to hear also, Lord. We just pray that you will also be with each one of us as we give back a part of what you give us to further your will in this church. We just pray this through Jesus Christ, your name, amen. You can see, be seated.
Good morning, Grace Chapel. Good to see you all this morning. If you please begin by turning with me to Philippians chapter 1. And before we begin, one extra announcement that I think was in the bulletin. We are going to have a Fall Fest meeting after service, so anybody that is able slash willing slash especially planning uh, to help with the event, we just ask that you please stay after service. We're going to meet in the fellowship hall, try to uh, get as many people assigned to where they're going to help the day of that we can. If you're planning to help so we can make sure that on the day of, We don't just show up and have a bunch of people that are looking to help but don't know where to go so we can have a bit more of a game plan. So I'd invite you to please stay and help. Again, we need volunteers in this church to pull off anything. And so we want to ask you to please stay after church. Join us in the fellowship hall for that. And to begin this morning again in Philippians chapter 1, I'd like to begin by reading the passage, and then we'll open in prayer. Apostle Paul writing, and we're going to begin in verse 12 and go down through the first part of verse 18. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that... I rejoice. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and worship as your people. And Lord, I pray as we go through this text today that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray if there be any here this morning that are discouraged with the life circumstances they find themselves in, that you would encourage their hearts, that you would bless them, and that you'd speak to us through your word this morning, that we would leave encouraged and edified, And, Lord, that we would glorify you with the lives that we lead as your people. We just ask your hand now upon the preaching of your word this morning. You would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm sure we've all seen pictures like the one that Chris is about to put up on the screen before. And if you've seen any sort of things along these lines, you'll notice that depending on how you look at them, you see a slightly different picture. At first glance, you see here a guy that looks kind of tough. At least I think he looks kind of tough. I wouldn't want to mess with him. right? He's got 5 o'clock shadow. He looks strong. He looks like he might be a tiny bit mean. You imagine if you could see the rest of the picture, he'd probably be a muscular guy. He'd probably be built pretty lean, and he'd probably have on some form of military camo shorts or or cargo shorts or something like this. But what happens if we turn the picture? If you flip the picture, all of a sudden... You see a guy that doesn't exactly look very tough. He looks rather jolly, I would say. He's no longer got five o'clock shadow. He's got a receding hairline. And I imagine that if we could see the rest of the picture, he probably has a nice big belly that matches the jolly face that he's got. There's many examples of funny pictures you can find online where it changes depending on how you look at it. Is it a frog or is it a horse? It depends on the way you look at it. Is it a duck or a seal? It depends on the way you look at it. It might even be a lady or a lamp. There's all sorts of different things. I find they're helpful concepts because amongst other things, they show us that if you look at something differently, sometimes you get different results. If you change your perspective, it can result in an entirely different picture. And I find this is a helpful analogy for life as well. I'm not saying if you stand on your head all of a sudden somebody that looks tough is going to look jolly, but you do find that when you look at life through a different lens or a different perspective, sometimes you get a different result. Sometimes people, when they're going through times of suffering and struggling, they have the mentality of, poor me, I'm going through all of this. 
But if you change your perspective, you might see something different. Or sometimes when people have somebody in their life they're not exactly thankful for, they look at this person and they say, you know, this person really needs to change. And maybe they're not the one that needs to change. Perhaps what needs to change most at different points in our lives is on our side of the equation with how we look at things. And the way we look at things, if we are able to change it, it might just, in fact, be life-changing. And so this is one of the reasons I believe we need this text this morning. I think it will help challenge us with the way that we look at life. And truly, if we can change the way we look at life and some of the negative circumstances that life might serve us, I truly believe it can change our life entirely. So this passage should present to us this morning both a challenge and an encouragement. But before we dive in, quick recap. If you weren't here last week, as you can tell, we are no longer in First and Second Samuel. We are now in New Testament, a book of Philippians, written by the great apostle Paul. And he writes this letter to a church that was very near and dear to his heart. He started this church, led these people to the Lord on his second missionary journey. And this was a church that was near to his heart because despite being a, a ra- rather poverty-stricken church, they weren't exactly well off. They were really generous with the Apostle Paul with their resources. And he writes this letter to encourage this young church uh, in a couple different ways. For one, to find joy during troubling circumstances. For two, on the need to find unity in the church through Christian humility. On the pursuit of Christ as the goal of life. And all of these ideas together can kind of be summed up with living as citizens of heaven, which is something that he mentions twice. And so last week we saw he opens his letter with a greeting. Hi, my name is Paul. This is who I am. Just a reminder. He offers them some assurance, kind of a pat on the back and a prayer. And now he's really going to dive into his purposes for writing. And this text this morning is truly amazing. If you'd look with me again first at verse 12. The Apostle Paul writes and says this. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So Paul opens the body of his letter. Right? He gets over the introductions, the little pat on the back, the opening prayer, kind of some of the formalities at the beginning. And he begins now the body of his letter. Now the phrase, I want you to know, was a common kind of transition to the body of a letter in his day. And so usually what they would do is they would say, I want you to know, and then they would go on to tell you a little bit about their life circumstances, a little life update, as it were, uh, when they would write letters in that time. Now I'm sure that this young church at Philippi probably cared an awful lot about the Apostle Paul. Right? For one, he was the one that took the gospel to Macedonia, to the region where Philippi was found. Those who composed the church at Philippi were primarily led to faith by Paul. There might have been more at this time, but Paul is the one that took the gospel to the, to the region of uh, Philippi and Macedonia. And so he's now in jail. Right? Remember, he's writing Philippians from jail. We're not entirely sure of the nature of his imprisonment. But if you were part of, the, of this church and you knew that your eternal destiny was changed by this guy, you probably care an awful lot about him, don't you think? And so you're wondering, what's going to happen? Paul's in jail. Is he going to be executed? How long is he going to be in jail for? What, what's going to be the result of all this? If you're somebody that cares about this guy naturally, surely when you receive a letter from his hand, you're wondering, how's he doing? Right? What's going on? Anytime you hear about somebody in the church that's not exactly doing well, people ask updates all the time, don't they? How is so-and-so doing? I heard they had this surgery. I have heard they came down with this diagnosis. How are they? You want to know what's going on in their lives. And you can imagine if you're part of this church, there was a guy by the name of Epaphroditus who brought the letter to them. And he brings this piece of ancient papyrus, which is what they had for paper, And he shows up at their little local congregation that had just been started with a letter from the great Apostle Paul. And if you are like me, I imagine everybody there is just wondering, how's he doing? Don't you think? You want a little update of what's going on in Paul's life. And what is so amazing in this text today is that Paul opens not with an update at how he's doing, 
Paul opens with an update at what God is doing in his life. And in fact, he points out from the very beginning that essentially things are going well, things are great. And if you're like me, you look at this and you say, Paul, you're nuts. Did you forget the part where you're in jail? Paul writes and he begins like, look, I've got good news for you guys. And you imagine that he wouldn't have good news because he's in jail. You think he might be upset or angry. If you've ever read the Old Testament accounts of Elijah, Elijah was offended with God. Remember, he was a great prophet. And when his life didn't turn out so great, his life was under threat, do you remember he's a little upset about all of this? He's like, God, I was, I was so zealous for you. And you kind of left me out to dry. Now I'm running for my life. God, what are you doing? You've let me down. Wonder this morning how many of us, if we were sent to jail for representing Jesus, how many of us would be a little mad at God? Think about it. Like all you're doing is ministry work. You're sharing the gospel. You're telling other people about what Jesus has done and, and your reward for that is jail. You can imagine it'd be kind of upsetting. But Paul doesn't complain and Paul doesn't accuse God of malpractice or like, God, how could you treat me like this? Instead, Paul's conclusion is, look, my life's circumstances... This whole jail time that I'm going through right now, this is served for the advancement of the gospel. This is good news. The idea is a movement forward to an improved state. The sense is that the gospel is moving throughout the world. The the good news of Jesus Christ is progressing into the rest of the world. And not only is it, it's not in spite of Paul's imprisonment, it's partially due to his imprisonment. What turned out originally he thought to be maybe a roadblock, maybe a detour, ends up becoming a shortcut. Think about it. How many times when you're driving and you see those orange detour signs, you get a little nervous? All of a sudden you think, this is going to add a half an hour to my trip. And you make the turn, you don't even know where you're going to end up. I heard recently that they put a detour sign in the wrong spot in Elysburg. And I just think that's great, don't you? (laughs) Like, being a worker at PennDOT is probably not the most exciting job. But when you get to be the guy that puts the detour sign in the wrong spot and send everybody down the wrong road and just sit back and laugh, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he didn't do it on purpose, but it'd be really funny if he did. Unless you were one of those poor souls that ended up down that wrong road. You don't look at detours and get excited. They're a pain. They're a pain. Right? There's something you're not planning for. Being put in jail for preaching, that sounds a little bit more like a detour. That sounds a bit more like plan B, doesn't it? And Paul says, look, this thing, it it was actually a good thing. This has served for the advancement of the gospel. And what's even more awesome, the Zondervan Bible background commentary points this out. Paul doesn't even offer much of an update about his own life. He doesn't share about his own life, his circumstances, any of these things. Instead, Paul gives an update at what God is doing in his life. And this is so neat. So much so, he doesn't give us any details. So much so that scholars aren't even 100% sure where Paul was in jail. Was he in jail in Rome? Maybe. Was he in jail in Caesarea? Maybe. Was he in jail in Ephesus? Possibly. We don't even know. People generally assume it's Rome, and that's kind of where I'm going to believe they're right, because they know more about it than I do. But Paul is writing, and you can imagine if you were on the other end of receiving this letter, you'd wonder, how is it for Paul? Is he chained to a guard or is he chained to a wall? Are they feeding him nice or are they giving him the leftover moldy bread from two weeks ago? Paul, what's your trial like? How much are you suffering for the gospel? What are you going through? And Paul, contrary to what everybody would expect, doesn't take this letter as a time to dump all of his negative emotions, to say, yeah, it really is awful here. I've got these sores around my wrists from all of this, the the chains rubbing against them, and I've lost 30 pounds because their bread isn't exactly tasty. He doesn't give you any of that. Instead of detailing his suffering, Paul details what God is doing. says this is all for the advancement 
of the gospel. So how in the world can Paul make such a startling claim? Let's look at verses 13 and 14. He said, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul at the beginning today makes this startling claim. My imprisonment has served for the advancement of the gospel. And we probably hear that at first and we say, how? Paul, you're, you used to be on a missionary journey telling everybody about Jesus. Now you're behind bars. How has this served for the advancement of the gospel? Paul says there's two results from his imprisonment. Number one, the gospel is progressing amongst the imperial guard against the guys, basically the prison staff. And two, his imprisonment empowered the everyday believer to be a witness about Jesus Christ. And so we're going to break these down a little bit. First, the imperial guard, again, the, the people that were taking care of him, they heard that his imprisonment was for Christ. They heard he was in jail for Jesus. And so in this sense, the gospel is reaching new people. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that the progress of the gospel here, it says that it continues its victorious march through the world in spite of Paul's elimination. So much so that the whole prison guard now hears that Paul's in prison for Jesus Christ. Now, if he is in jail in Rome, which is what we assume, this imperial guard or the Latin praetorium is what the group was called, could have been anywhere from 9,000 to 12,000 thousand soldiers. Now when Paul says the whole, does that mean every tiny individual last guy probably heard? Probably not quite yet. But the bulk of this force of perhaps 10,000 guys has heard there's this guy by the name of Paul from the city of Tarsus who's in jail because of his testimony about Jesus the Christ. And you can imagine if Paul's in jail he's probably got a bit of a captive audience. Can you imagine this? Whether he's chained to a guard or chained to a wall being guarded, you can probably imagine that the guy that was responsible for watching Paul probably got an earful about Jesus Christ. So much so that maybe, just maybe, the guard was more captive than Paul was. And so Paul tells guard after guard after guard after guard, yeah, I am here because I was preaching about Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? He is the Christ. He's the Messiah who came down to save us from our sin. You can imagine this conversation. And so now Paul is in jail, but we have had thousands upon thousands, presumably, of imperial guards hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. It's pretty amazing. One commentator likens it to the Trojan horse, that Paul is now behind enemy lines, has effectively snuck in by means of his imprisonment and is now able to hit the heart of the Gentile world with the gospel. Truly, this is one further fulfillment of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus said that his disciples would be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and unto the, in Samaria and the undermost parts of the earth. Right? Originally, Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. The good news began in Jerusalem, but then it goes out from there to the rest of the world. And now Paul, again, presumably in Rome, is testifying of the good news of Jesus. Reminds me of the passage where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not only is Paul not out of commission, but now the gospel has infected the imperial guard. And I think this is an important reminder to us this morning that ultimately, if we are part of the church, we're on the winning side. You might look at Paul in jail and think, oh, he's defeated. But even though, one scholar says, even though the messenger was bound, God's message cannot be bound. Right? The gospel is progressing. More people were getting saved. The imperial guards were hearing the good news. All of this was good things. It's a reminder to me that even today, the world, it's a messy place. You look at the news and it's nothing but bad all the time and it's getting worse. No matter who you follow, nobody ever shares good news. Because good news doesn't sell. It's a competition for who's got the baddest news. And so many people look at the world today and they're discouraged. And there's probably some reason to be discouraged. 
But can I tell you a reason to be encouraged is that heaven is more filled today than it was yesterday. Right? God's good news is going out into the world and more people are getting saved day by day by day. So even though it's messy on the world stage, even though we might not be happy with American politics, whatever else it might be, do you know that people are getting saved and Jesus is building his church? And that's good news. Every day, the gospel continues its progress into the world. It did through Paul, through this imperial guard here. And Paul's second reason that he lists here, not only has it infected the imperial guard, but secondly, it empowered others. So that others were more bold to share the gospel without fear. These everyday believers, wherever he was in jail, again, probably Rome, they're, they're empowered to share the gospel with others. So not only is it advancing on the world stage and going to a wider audience, but now the gospel is going deeper into the audience it already has. It's reaching more people, but it's more thoroughly reaching those who already have it so that they're being bold to share their faith. And so this is amazing. The believers grow in their confidence in the Lord, and the source of this confidence is God, but the means by which God gives them this confidence is through Paul's imprisonment. It almost makes me think of times, if you've ever been at a sporting event, and if you've ever seen a coach get thrown out of a game, doesn't that just fire up the team a little bit? Right, everybody's always mad at refs because no ref has ever made a good call ever in their lives. The poor guys, everybody hates them all the time. And you know that when it gets really wild, sometimes coaches will kind of, they'll bust the clipboard and they'll kind of do their little antics. And you know any team that their coach gets thrown out, all of a sudden it's like there's this rallying cry, right? Almost like that's a shot of adrenaline right in the arm. Like our coach got thrown out, we're going to go win the game now. I've heard some coaches like to get thrown out just because it gives them that extra little shot in the arm. This is kind of what happens with Paul. Or you imagine the great apostle to the Gentiles, the guy that started their church, he's in jail and they're like, well, what have we got to lose, right? We could go now and share the gospel with others. And so Paul's going to continue and share some ways in which the gospel is going out through people, if you'd look with me at verses 15 through 17. He says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. And the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So Paul says the gospel is advancing in the imperial guard and through the believers. And now we get a kind of a further clarification about those who are sharing the good news. It says, yeah, the believers in wherever it was, probably Rome, they are more empowered. They're more bold to share the word without fear. And then he's like, you know, some people do it with good motives. Some people do it with bad. Some people preach with good will. They preach with love, knowing that he had been put there, placed there sovereignly by God, for the defense of the gospel. They believed Paul was was in the right. They believed that he was a servant of God and that God had placed him where he was at. But then there's this other crew, and they preach with envy. They preach with selfish ambition as their aim. Not sincerely, Paul says, but seeking to afflict him in his imprisonment. Now, we are reminded that if it was at Rome, Paul was not the first one to take the gospel to Rome. So if all of a sudden he shows up there, Perhaps if there was already some different preachers and people there, they were threatened because the great apostle has now come in town. And so it's kind of nice to have him as competition out of the way. They're kind of able to grow in their celebrity status as ministers because Paul's in jail. And so out of selfish ambition, they're now using him out of the way as a means for their own personal gain. Basically, they add gas to the fire. Not only is Paul in jail, but now these guys are preaching, trying to afflict him in prison. And so we wonder, is Paul upset about this? Is Paul bothered with people preaching with bad motives? We're going to see what he finishes today with in verse 18. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So we look at this passage today. If you're like me at first, you're like thinking Paul's a little crazy. He begins and he's talking about how he's in jail. 
He says, you know, my imprisonment has served for the advancement of the gospel. And at first glance, you're probably thinking, Paul, I think you're a little crazy. Paul, why are you celebrating being in jail? Like, do you realize that you're in jail, the, the jail part? Did you catch that? You're happy about this? And if you look at this and you think that's crazy, now you see this 18th verse, you're like, well, now Paul's totally lost it. He's nuts. He's celebrating somebody preaching with bad motives? Pretty crazy thought, isn't it? Paul says, yeah, there's people out there preaching with selfish ambition as their drive. They're trying to make a name for themselves when they're out telling people about Jesus. He's like, that's great. I'm going to rejoice. You're like, Paul, what are you thinking? What part of this makes you want to rejoice? Paul might be able to see these guys are scoundrels. Maybe they're not preaching with good motives. Maybe they're not doing everything the way they should be. But their message is true. And that's what makes the difference for Paul. Now, if you read the rest of the New Testament, you know that he doesn't exactly tolerate people who preach a false gospel. Right? So a true gospel with bad motives, well, it's okay because it's a true message. False gospel, if you've ever read the book of Galatians, you'll know that, God, that Paul has opinions about things. Right? There was people that were saying, yeah, to be saved, you've got to believe Jesus, all that. You also have to be circumcised. You know what that is? You can ask your mom after service. They're mandating this as part of salvation like because it was such an integral part of the Old Testament. And Paul is like, who has bewitched you guys? You've lost your minds that you think this is what the gospel is. If you read Galatians 5, he has some very choice words to say about these guys. One scholar once, or one commentator once said about them being super circumcised. That's what Paul thinks of those who preach a false gospel. Go read it. Galatians 5.12. Look it up after service. He has no tolerance for somebody that's preaching a false message. None at all. If they're preaching a false gospel, he's like, no, throw them out. That's horrible. But Paul is willing to look at these guys, presumably in Rome, and says, yeah, maybe their motives aren't great, but their gospel is true, and because of that, they're proclaiming the real Jesus, and because of that, I'm going to choose to rejoice, because their message is true. Ultimately, a true gospel with flawed messengers, that'll do. Because for one, do you know that flawed messengers are the only kind that God has to work with? And I think Paul's attitude here is so instructive for us, and this to me has been so helpful. So many churches in the world, so many denominations in the world, I mean, there's tons of them, right? If they're not careful, if we're not careful, sometimes we could be so focused on our camp, our section, that we think everybody else has got it all wrong. Tons of denominations think they are the only ones that have a monopoly on truth. And as such, if we aren't careful, we end up looking at other churches, other denominations, other ministries as competition. You know this. I want to encourage us this morning that the church's aim should never be to compete with other churches. I want to remind us that we are all part of the same team. The church should not be like Burger King versus McDonald's, who can make the least lousy cheap hamburger, appealing to the same audience, trying to take people from the other crowd, trying to take consumers from the other crowd. Some people think, oh, well, we just need to get all the Christians to come to our church. I want to remind us this morning, we are on the same team. If the other church is preaching a true biblical gospel, we are part of the same team. Just about every week, I meet with a group of other local pastors. We've got Dan Reno from Mount Carmel, Roger Segrist from Mount Carmel, Andrew Nisley from Elysburg, Ferd Madera from Shemokin, and me, and occasionally some others. Can I encourage us this morning? These guys preach a true biblical gospel. And if one of them comes to the pastor's gathering and says, hey, I had visitors at my church, you know what we all say? Praise the Lord, that's great. I'm glad God brought somebody to your church. If somebody comes and they're like, yeah, I, I got to baptize somebody the other day, and they were actually an adult that came forward for baptism. You know what we all think? This is great news. 
I'm glad your church is doing good. Right? Not one of us is going to say, well, that's really lousy. God's growing your church. That's horrible. I hope your church shrinks and dies and that they all come to my church. Not one of us thinks that way. Why? Because we're all part of the same team. As long as we're preaching the same biblical gospel. Now, this obviously doesn't work for every single church in the world. There are some churches that promote a false gospel. There are some churches that lead people down the broad road, absolutely. And that's a different category, right? They're not on the same team as us. Sure, there are some in that camp, but I would tell you they're probably a lot smaller than we realize. We can disagree on secondary doctrines and all sorts of other things, but if their gospel message is the truth, we should be able to celebrate the successes of others, because ultimately God is building his church, whether it's here or there. That's good news. Somebody being taken out from the domain of darkness and being brought into the kingdom of God's beloved son, whether it was through me or another pastor, I don't care. I'm glad to see the kingdom of God is growing. Aren't you? I mean, I'd love to see Grace Chapel grow. I would. I'd love to see our church filled. But I'm not going to be complaining if our church is empty, if somebody else's church is being filled with new converts, I'm happy that the gospel is going forth. And this is what Paul is saying. Even if these guys preach with with bad motives, their message is true. Sure, these guys are lousy, and they should probably fix how they're doing things and their motives and all this, but they're leading people to Jesus. So even if they're doing it with bad motives, they're still filling heaven. This is good news. I think we should have the same attitude this morning, that no matter what vessel God chooses to use, as long as they present a biblical gospel, if God blesses their church, their ministry, whatever, we're all part of the same team serving the kingdom of God. And ultimately, we see Paul's teaching in this passage, and we learn this idea that as believers, we ought to search to reframe life's circumstances and to see how God might be at work in them. Again, Paul's primary concern that we see in this passage today is the gospel. It's not his life. It's not his circumstances. It's not his comfort or his freedom or any of these other things. Those aren't primary to Paul. Paul is able to lay aside all of the things that make him miserable naturally to celebrate what God is doing in his life. Because the gospel to Paul was everything. And why does that matter so much? I want to remind us this morning, the gospel is God's message of salvation. The gospel is the means by which Jesus builds his church. Scripture says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word or the good news of Jesus Christ. The only way that somebody can come into the kingdom of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. The only way they can put their faith in Jesus Christ is if they hear the good news of what Jesus has done for them. That's why it's so important to Paul. He says he's not ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That is the good news this morning. It's the power of God to salvation. It's the means by which God grows his church. And what is that gospel? What is that good news? It's ultimately the message of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of salvation in Jesus, that he made a way for us to be reconciled with our creator. Because all mankind has fallen short of God's standard. Every human being has sinned. No one is sufficiently righteous to be found right standing with God. On the day of judgment, human beings on our own were toast. But Jesus Christ made a way for us to be forgiven by a free gift of God's grace. Where he came down to pay our debts while we were still sinners. He became sin for us who knew no sin, so that in him we can become the righteousness of God. That message, it was the heartbeat of Paul's life, and it should be the heartbeat of our life. If we have been recipients of a grace that is that great, that should characterize everything we do. And that should be something we can celebrate no matter where God prospers it. I want to encourage you here this morning, that if you have not received Jesus Christ and you have not responded to the gospel, it is the way that we can be reconciled with God. The scripture says that Jesus is the way, not one of many. He is the truth, not one of many. And he is the life, not one of many. He is the only way 
that we can be reconciled with God. And that is why Paul puts such an emphasis on the gospel, and it's why we should as well. I want to tell you this morning, if you don't know where you stand with the Lord today, I would love to speak with you after the service. And if there be all of us here today who have received Jesus Christ, who have believed on him, who have trusted him for our salvation and right standing before God, I want to challenge us with something as we close this morning, namely on how we view our life's circumstances. I would dare say Paul's life was probably harder than all of ours. You look back over the suffering that he went through, especially there's a passage, I I didn't write it down, I think it's 2 Corinthians. He lists all the problems that he's had. He's received a whip upon his back, right? 40 lashes minus one. He's been stoned. He's been hit with rocks till they were convinced he was dead. Left for dead. Gets back up, crawls, keeps on preaching. He had been shipwrecked, floating like a scene from a movie at sea, holding on to the boards and stuff. This is who Paul was. He was in jail enough times that we're not even sure which time he was in jail that he's writing this letter. This is the life that Paul lived. And again, from the passage that we're reading, he writes all of Philippians from jail. I would say his life was probably harder than ours. But Paul was convinced that even in the midst of his hardships, God was at work. Do you see this this morning? And again, if we were like the Philippians, if we were the recipients of this letter initially, we would all want to know what's going on in his life. We would want to know about his suffering. We would want to know the drama. We would want to know how is he being fed and treated and what are his chains like. We would want to know all these things. Probably. But Paul doesn't put himself or his circumstances, his life's troubles, is the focus of this letter. Again, so much so that we don't have hardly any details. We just know that he's in jail, but we don't have any of the information beyond that. And Paul shows us so clearly this morning that God wasn't just at work in spite of Paul's troubles, but he was actually at work through Paul's troubles. Again, instead of detailing his suffering, Paul details God's work on his behalf. And on the surface, we imagine things were horrible. He's not free. He's not able to come and go as he pleases. He's not able to just go do whatever he wants. He's got some problems. Life, as it were, would seem to be better if he was free. But what Paul does is he tilts the picture and he sees it from a different angle. Instead of seeing his suffering and saying, man, it really sucks to be Paul right now. I hate being in prison. This is miserable. I just hope I get out one of these days. And every day he wakes up and is like, it's, it's awful to be me right now. I just hope I get out of this. He could have lived in jail that way every day, and he would have been miserable the whole time he was there. But he tilts the picture and he says, wait a minute, being in jail might not be great, but God is at work through my imprisonment. This is great news. My circumstances aren't very good, but God is working through them to advance his gospel. Look at all the great things God is doing through my problems. Man, I'm glad I got these problems because God's at work in them. God used that horrible circumstance in Paul's life to reach this imperial guard. How many of those guards might not have heard the gospel if Paul wouldn't have been in jail? Think about it. You have people that are, that are dying that never heard the good news about Jesus, but now you've got the great apostle. People think it's horrible because he's behind bars, but he's reaching an entirely different audience. God is at work. So he concludes... I've got plenty of reason to rejoice because I can see all that God is doing despite how hard my life is. And as we look at Paul today, I want to challenge us. Church, joy is a choice that we can make in life. Joy is a choice that we can make in life. Here's what Paul couldn't choose. Paul could not choose to leave jail I don't think. I don't think he could have just got up one day and went to the guard and said, you know what? I think I'd like to get out of here. Could you just let me out? And the guard said, oh, sure. You should have just asked sooner. We'll just let you right on out. 
Paul couldn't choose to get up and leave. That wasn't a decision that he had the power to make. Paul couldn't presumably choose his menu. They probably weren't coming and saying, here is a three-course meal, and here's all your options. What would you like to eat today, Paul? And he says, I would like the steak and potatoes, please, with ice cream for dessert. Presumably, he couldn't choose those things. Paul could not choose to change any of his circumstances. But what Paul could do was choose to find joy in the midst of his circumstances by seeing how God was at work through them. He saw his circumstances from a different angle, and he chose joy. Now, that's easier said than done, isn't it? It's easy to look at Paul's life and say, yep, Paul, this is easy. God's at work. Look at this. The gospel's going out. It's great news, Paul. You should be happy. And he's like, but reminder, I'm in jail, and you're not. It's easier to do that. It's easy for me to look at your life and say, well, you should just choose joy. It's that easy. Just pick it. Just choose joy. Just stop being upset all the time. It's easier to say that way. I'm sure all of us know that theology is always more developed in the lives of others than our own. We can look at others and have solutions to their problems, and then we don't have solutions to our own. I don't want to say this morning that this is an easy thing to do and just say, it's just simple, you didn't just do this. But at the same time, it is rather simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. See, Paul was able to look at his own suffering from God's perspective. That for all of us, I think this morning, is the challenge is to be able to see the life circumstances that we would change if we could, but we can't, try to see them from God's perspective. See how he might be working through our lives. I want to challenge us how different our lives might be if we could live this way. A couple examples. If you have a health challenge, whatever that might be, you can go to a doctor, and you should. You can get the medication, and you should. And you can get the treatment, and you should. And you can pray about it, and you should. Is there a guarantee that you can change the circumstance that you're facing? Nope. There's no guarantee that you're going to get better. I've never seen a doctor that says, here's a money-back guarantee. They give you money-back guarantees on everything but doctors, it seems. There's no guarantee. And you can try everything and you should, but your situation might not change. You might not be able to change the situation you're in. But can I encourage you this morning, you can change your attitude regarding the situation. Again, it's easier said than done, but perhaps God is putting you in a place where you can reach others with the hope of the gospel that you would not be able to reach from your regular life. I'm sure that countless Christians have spent hours upon hours upon hours in the hospital complaining about how much it is awful to be them when God had placed them there so they could talk to others about the goodness of God in their life. Again, it's easier said than done, but if you change your perspective, you might see that God's at work in your life. Or perhaps God just allows us to endure hardships so that we become a a more gospel-focused person where we keep in mind the goodness of eternal life and the sure hope that we have. God works through trials. They don't come to us apart from him. Perhaps you're here this morning, you're facing a big disappointment in life. You applied for a job, or you applied for a college, or something else. Maybe you applied for a spouse, and they denied you. I don't know what it might be. And your plans fell through. Sometimes decisions are made that you can't change, but you can change the way you look at it. Maybe this is one way that God is steering your life towards better plans that he has for you. I want to challenge all of us this morning that instead of complaining and instead of dwelling on the things that we can't change, because believe me, there are countless things in our lives that we can't change, that we would if we could, but we can't. Instead of that, we ought to look at at life with the question, how is God at work in the circumstances of my life? Last week, we saw that God has begun a good work in us. We saw that God is going to finish the work that he began. This week, we seek to answer the question, how is God at work in us? I want to challenge you that living as a citizen of heaven should cause us to reframe life's troubles with the questions, how is God at work in me? How is God growing me? And how is God conforming me to the image of his son through these things? Ultimately, 
How might the gospel come out of the mess in my life? It's not easy, and I'm not going to claim it is, but it's what God desires for us. And we must trust that his ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. And truly he is at work in us somehow. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are at work in us, that you have begun a good work in us, all of those who believe, that you started this work and that you will carry it on to completion at the day that your son Jesus Christ returns. I thank you for this wonderful assurance, and I thank you for the assurance that you are working in our lives throughout our lives, not just at the beginning and end, but you work in us in ways that we'll never even imagine. And Lord, as I shared this morning, we know that the answer to some of these things might be simple, but it's not easy. It's easy to say that we shouldn't complain and we should find the way that you're working in our lives. It's simple to say, but it's hard to do. Father, I pray you would give us all grace to try and look at this life through a gospel-colored lens, that we might see how you are at work in our lives in ways that we would have never forecasted, we might never have asked for it, but God, to be able to see your hand at work and to be able to rejoice in what you're doing, even if we would change our circumstances, if we could. I pray that your people would find encouragement in this and grace, Lord, to believe that you're at work in us. And we thank you, Father, for this assurance in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to turn to communion. And if you want to begin, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians 11. I want to encourage you all here this morning as we ponder the good news of the gospel, as we shared so much about the gospel this morning and this wonderful assurance that we have of eternal life. I want to remind us that this is all a work of grace that we don't deserve, that he has bestowed on us freely through his son. And as we partake of communion, we remember what Jesus did for us, the stripes he bore on his back, the nail-pierced hands and all of this, And this is something that we who believe do in order to remember his death, to proclaim his death until he comes. I want to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, Paul writing to the church at Corinth says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I want to invite you all to examine your hearts this morning as the men come forward and we partake of communion. Bill, would you mind praying for the bread this morning?
Again, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> For I received from the Lord that what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread this morning. Steve, would you mind blessing the cup this morning? Scripture says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup this morning. And at this time, Kevin and Lisa are going to lead us in a closing song. rise as we close with Jesus loves me this morning.
thou. Dear Lord, we are so glad that you loved us this morning, that you loved us so much that you sent, came to the cross and died for us, gave your life that we could have eternal life, Lord, that you gave up your blood and your, your flesh for, for us. And Lord, as we partook of the communion this morning, we remembered you, remembered the love that you showed to us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you. We pray, Lord, you would help us to show love to those we come in contact with, to show your love to them and let them know that Jesus loves them as well. Lord, go with us as we leave this place. Help us not to leave your presence, but to take you with us and bring it back again safe into your service. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.